Hey there, I'm Cindy Coaches, and I am the host of Pen to Paper Press Podcast. I sit down with best-selling authors, writers, edit- editors, publishers, and creative souls in my virtual studio to talk about the process of developing our stories to completing our works of art. Each episode is an opportunity for us to explore mindsets, pearls of wisdoms, and the experiences that began our journey as a writer from the moment we put pen to paper. In this episode, I am speaking with Dorothy Hewson. She is a licensed marriage and family therapist, and she's the author of Breaking the Chains of Transgenerational Trauma, My Journey from Surviving to Thriving. I've been looking forward to this conversation. We spoke briefly for a pre-interview conversation, and our conversation touched on exploring the topics ranging from overcoming writer's block to self-editing to getting our books in the hands of readers. And as always, these conversations tend to follow a natural flow, so I'm curious to see where this goes. Dorothy, it is my pleasure to welcome you to the Pen to Paper Press studio. Oh, thank you so much. I really am happy to be here and uh, looking forward to our conversation as well. One of the first things that I, when I was preparing for today's interview that came to me that it was like, we really need to touch on this subject. And it how does health, our physical health, our mental health affect our creative process? And in, you know, in particular, because this is a podcast for writers and creatives, how does it affect our process for writing? Hmm. Yeah, I think it's uh, completely connected, very connected. Uh, The creative process is part of uh, who we are and how we express ourselves our true selves and writing is definitely a creative part of that creative art that we can use to express our true selves. So definitely there's, there's a connection there. And then it's also, um, a, you know, a tool that we can use is to um, discover, explore and, face our fears, uh, feel our feelings, um, really get in touch with the mind-body connection, who we are at our core. And that's the way I think writing has really helped me. Uh, It's it's my main, I think, creative tool that I use to express my true self. And that's what I did in in my book as well. I uh, used it it took me three years to write my book and I used it as a, a tool to discover who I am. And then beyond that express who I am to the world, which can be pretty scary. <laughs> yes, it can. <laughs> you know, and I have to, I have to say something because when you were, you know, were describing and I, I giggled when you said, and to express our fear because so many times we hold that back. We hold back that or stifle or try to hide those what people have termed as negative emotions. And what, because there's been such a push to be positive, be happy, be excited, you know, all this enlightenment. And so then when we feel those fears and stuff, and that was a natural, like, a giggle that slipped out it's one of those nervous giggle things that I have and it was like yeah I'm dealing with that with you know with the book I'm writing right now it's like yeah I'm not real sure I want to share those fears so <laughs> I, I just wanted to you know let you know that that yeah. I giggled there it's not because it's like I take pleasure in other people's fear because I don't. (laughs) Yeah, that's, that's interesting, because um, I don't know if I wrote about this in my book, but I did develop a um, odd reaction to fear as well. Um, My book is about um, PTSD, complex PTSD from uh, childhood sexual abuse. And so as I was writing my book and, and also healing from PTSD. 
I came to understand myself and a, a lot of the unanswered questions or the confusion about my life started to fall into place. And one of the things that I did discover was that I had a, a natural response that I would call a miscue now okay. to smile and giggle and laugh when I felt uncomfortable, when I felt distressed or, or scared yeah. or any kind of distressing uh, anxiety, I responded with a miscue of giggling and smiling and, and um, just like, just like you, you just described. Yeah. And it's, and it's a natural response. And again, it, it's, I guess you really shouldn't apologize for it because it just slipped out, you know, mm -hmm. one of those unconscious, like, things so <laughs> and of course me knowing that you're a therapist and then I'm like in the back of my mind within split sections in split sections thinking oh shit <laughs> 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 oh no did I just blow this whole entire interview because now she's going to be like oh boy I'm dealing with one of those <laughs> yeah and I, I think it's kind of natural for us as women we uh well not all women but a uh, certain uh personality i guess types to want to keep the peace like when we feel uncomfortable we've been trained to keep the peace to be kind to let's lower the conflict level so that yes that reaction you know to smile to laugh um helps it it helps people diffuse anxiety and, you know, conflict, especially in, in conflict, we use humor. Oh, you know? my gosh. Yes. <laughs> yes, we do. Uh -huh. Wow. Well, I'm, I'm getting more out of this conversation. Because <laughs> now I'm going to, after we get done, I can tell as soon as we get done here, I'm going to be like sitting down to my journal going, okay, this happened and this I'm <laughs> aware of. And <laughs> oh, oh my goodness. And I, one thing I, I like to ask, but I already kind of sort of know the answer because it's, it's one of those things that I want to make sure that people who are writing their first book or heck, they're even their third book to understand that writer's block is something that happens to all of us. It really does. And I'm assuming you experienced writer's block as well. Um, yes. What are some of the things that you did to push through your resistance to, you know, get the words on the page? I, I experience writer's block all the time, even today. Uh, I've been trying to work on a blog article um, that I want to write about nurture, um, how, how we can nurture ourselves. Mm -hmm. And even, even today, I, I, uh, something that works for me when I'm really blocked <laughs> is, uh, and, and I learned this tip from, from other people, from other writers, is to set my timer and um, tell myself that, okay, for the next 50 minutes, I'm going to sit at my computer and I'm either going to write or do nothing. I'm not going to look at Facebook. I'm not going to read my emails. I'm not going to answer my phone. I'm not going to uh, get distracted and, and allow myself to do anything other than write. If I don't write, I can just sit here and, and you know, be with myself. And uh, that's it. Well, what inevitably always happens is I start writing. Yes. And it gets me over that hump. That, And, and I think for me, writer's block is, is this fear that I, I want to write what's real. I want to write what I'm truly feeling, like my deepest um, true self uh, feelings and opinions. And at the same time, I want to be liked by people. So I have this fear that um, 
it's not going to be good enough. Like my, whatever I write, is not going to be good enough. And it's a fear that I struggle with. Yeah. That inner critic that tells us that we're not good enough, that somebody else has already written this. You're not unique. Oh yeah. Familiar with that friend. <laughs> yeah. And that somehow if I write my, what's what I, what's real for me, that it's not good enough, then that's like a, a judgment on who I am. Yeah. And that's scary. <laughs> It is scary. It's I, I wholeheartedly agree. And I have to admit, I have not heard that idea of sitting down and doing nothing other than writing. Um, I like how you put, you know, how you presented that, because I've not heard that one before as a technique to either you write or you sit. Oh, really? Oh, yeah, I've not heard that. I, well, I, I'm glad I, I was, um, you know, able to give something new, some new information to you, a new, a new tool. Uh, I had heard it from um, other, other people. I can't even remember who, but I do read a lot of books about writing. So mm -hmm. I probably heard it from or read it from one of those books. Yeah, I, I've been reading, well, I'm writing a memoir. And so, of course, I'm reading a lot of books on memoir writing, based on my research on the book and, and on you, um, and listening to chapter five, because you offer a free reading of chapter five on your website. Um, to me, your book is both a memoir with personal growth tools because you do offer, you know, exercises. You do share some uh, some of those tools, and also it is a trauma, you know, help somebody through uh, a self help book for those that have experienced trauma. I, am I correct in in how how to present your book to share? Yes. So in answer to your question, um, you're spot on. I think the way you described my book is um, correct in that it's a teaching a self-development book and it's a memoir put together. And um, the, the way that I've heard it framed before, again, this isn't from me, but um, this is how Kelly Notaris, who's um, also an author, and I went to her um writing retreat and she calls it a teaching memoir so she kind of specializes in helping um, get books uh, published and written that are in this kind of genre where it's my personal story so it's and it's also my my family's history because my book is about transgenerational trauma. So it's not only my story, but it's my family's um, history of their stories. My, I go back to my grandmother's story and then further on forward to my children and grandchildren. So it's my story, but it's also a teaching alongside. So every chapter, there's a teaching about trauma, about transgenerational trauma, and about uh, how it gets transferred through the relationship between a parent and a child. So there's parenting teaching, there's relationship teaching, um, there's neuroscience teaching because uh, parenting is about passing on our survival skills through our brains, through our, I mean, you know, through the connection that right. we make mm -hmm. be between a parent and a child that forms at a very young age. So knowing all that we know today, which is um, very fascinating, mm -hmm. uh, using all, all the neuroscience, um, all the research that's uh, quite recent um, is added into the book. So it's, it is, it's, it's a teaching memoir. When I when I went onto your website, Dorothy's website is Dorothy Houston and it's H U S E N dot com. And on your on your cover page or your home page, um, <clears throat> you have the statement. And when I read it, it was like, okay, 
now I know what not only what the book is, you know, in representation of, but also how you how you function as a therapist. <clears throat> and, you know, it just it really gave me a lot of insight. And this is what you wrote. It's lost connection. When parents are consistently unable to attune to their child, the bond or connection between parent and child can develop in ways that make it difficult for the child to be resilient and manage trauma or traumas, excuse me, because our very survival as infants depends on our parenting or primary caregiver, that relationship makes a huge impression on, uh, on us. Uh, so the quality of it is important, which obviously we know that, especially as being moms. <laughs> um, it layers the groundwork for what we expect from and how we behave in other relationships, including, and most especially, our relationship with ourselves. And, you know, I, I read that and I thought somehow this has to come into it has to be in the podcast. And, and I wasn't sure how it was going to come filtering into the podcast, but it hit me how much our mental and our physical health and, and our life experiences really do mold us, but also how it how we pass those on yeah. you know, to the future generations and the people that are around us. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think what you read there is actually the beginning of chapter five, which is about the teaching in chapter five is about attachment. So yeah, it's, um, that's how we pass on how we relate to each other, how we f- find our emotional, get our emotional needs met mm-hmm. is through the relationship with our, with our parents and that relationship gets laid down by the time we're three years old. So it's Mm pre-verbal and it's laid down in the deep part of our brain, in our body, what's called procedural memory. So we take this foundational way to relate with people, how, how, how we feel loved and how we stay safe in our family of origin, how we get our needs met is how it, it, it's the, the map or the framework or the or the foundation that we lay upon all our other relationships. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I I clicked on the listen to chapter five, and I I scrolled ahead, and because I just wanted to capture, you know, a glimpse of it. And I ended up listening to it for quite a bit. And actually, I was listening to it just before um, our interview. And it was like, oh, I got to quit this. So I got to go do that. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, that makes me happy that you said that. uh... (laughs) Now, is that you that's reading chapter five and and you recorded that or? That's me on my um, website. Yes, that's Mm me. Um, Since then, though, I've had a professional narrator um, read my book for audible or for an audio version. So the version that you will, if you purchase it, the audible version. One of the things that I would like to go back to is, you know, developing your storyline for you, because you did take, like you mentioned, three years to write the book. And you're you're very busy you know life happens all of that so you know i one of the things that i i have mentioned prior podcasts is i want to break that element of people thinking that writers just sit down and we pound out a book that it does take time and it takes a lot of of work and dedication and that persistence to keep going Excuse me, for you, when you sat down to write the content, did it just fall on the pages or, you know, how did you approach writing your book? I guess that maybe that's how I should Mm -hmm. ask the question. Yeah, I started out, so I was very fortunate 
I was encouraged to write my book by a, a very good friend who is a ghostwriter and she's now a book, book coach. So we met in a, uh, a business coaching um, program that we were both clients of. Her name is Christine Kane. And so we were both clients of Christine Kane. And then we became friends and she's a ghostwriter trying to, to branch out into becoming a book coach. And I'm, you know, I'm a marriage and family therapist. So we just clicked and, and started, you know, talking and, and becoming friends. And eventually I told her my story and my life story. And she was very um, enthusiastic (laughs) (laughs) about me writing my story in a book form. And so um, with her encouragement, I started writing and she said, you know, I'll help you. It's what I do. I'm, you know, I'm a book coach, so I'll, I'll help you. I'll in- encourage you along the way, guide you. And so it started, um, I started just writing my story, just like chronologically. It, it was just getting everything down on the paper, everything d- you know, every experience, uh, my whole, my whole story. And it was voluminous, voluminous, voluminous. No, I scratch that. That's not the right (laughs) word. Um, It was, it was a lot of pages. It was a lot of words, um, too, too many words. And, but I needed to get it all down. That was my process. So I got it all down on the paper. um, And then the process of working with Beth, my uh, friend, was cutting, starting to cut it and get clear on the message that I wanted to, right. um, you know, what did I want to say? W- what is it that I want my readers to go away with? And so she helped me keep rewriting and rewriting and cutting and cutting and getting clearer and clearer. And then um, what happened was this um I went to Kelly Notaris's writing retreat and she had this outline for teaching memoirs, which was okay. what I was writing. Mm-hmm. And then I was able to really use that outline to really pare it down and get it even clearer. And then, um, and yeah. And, and then the, the other um, point I'd like to make was, there was a shift in my mindset when uh, Beth asked me, you know, do you want, I mean, you can, you can um, publish it now. It's a good book, Mm -hmm. but do you want your readers to read it? Do you want readers to enjoy reading it? And that's when I, I, that kind of shift took place in my mind that, Oh, Okay, so now I need to rewrite it again, but write it so that for the reader and not for me anymore. It, there was a shift that took place that I started to think about what would people want to read rather than what is it that I want to say? Because I was very focused on what I wanted to say, not necessarily what people will want to read. Oh my goodness, she brought up a brilliant perspective. And yeah, I could see where that would most certainly shift that like, and and I could see like the aha moment, like, oh no, <laughs> I got to rewrite this again. Oh, and, but then this yeah. time there's probably more excitement because now you have even a more, narrowed down version of what it is you want to share yes yeah yeah and that's why it makes me so happy when I hear like you you couldn't stop listening to it and I do get that kind of feedback from people like I couldn't put it down I was reading it I I was going to read it you know I started reading it and then I finished it within a couple of days that makes me feel really good because that's how I wrote it I intentionally wrote it for people to enjoy reading it. 
And it, what a blessing your friendship is. And isn't it just interesting how these people come into our lives at at just the right moment. I love that synchronicity. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful for you. And then, so then when it came time, when you came to the point where it's like, okay, I'm ready to publish my book. Obviously you rewrote it many times. It wasn't like a sit down, write it, you know, pound the, the keyboard and voila, I got a book. But once you got to the point of, okay, I'm going to publish this. I'm actually going to publish my story because we all have that moment of, no, this is, I'm going to keep this for me. Or it's like that, that proverbial fork in the road where it's like, we go this way or we can publish it. And how did you decide to publish it the way that you published your book? What were some of the, those key elements that like, this is the path I want to take? Yeah, um, Beth was a big influence on me. She kept encouraging me to use professionals. Uh, and also Kelly Notaris also was um, also influential on me because she also, you know, encouraged, don't try and do it on your own. I mean, you can, mm -hmm. but it's better if you use a professional. So uh, like hire somebody who knows how to design book covers because your book cover is really important. Mm -hmm. And then um, she suggested that I um, look into using a hybrid. I think they're called hybrid publishers where I, you know, I pay them. They don't pay me, right? but they um, take care of the publishing process of my book. Yeah. They, they did the editing and um, there was a lot that went on actually that I don't really know because I didn't do it. I hired authority publishing to do it for me. Okay. And I, I appreciate that you brought up use the professionals. Yes, you can do it on your own. And it's easy to want to do that because people look at it, oh, this is going to cost me an arm and a leg and oh, I don't want to spend the money. And then then they're, they get the book published, you know, they, they publish it themselves and then they look back at it and go, oh, oh, there's an error. Oh, there's an error. Not that by using a publishing company, it's error free because uh, a couple of weeks ago I had I had interviewed a gal who has a the hybrid publishing company and she she's like every book is imperfect there is no such thing as a perfect book and you know so that i i really appreciate that you had shared um, what you just did going back to what i was saying about using professionals again people look at it as an expense oh do I really want to spend this money versus looking at it as being, this is an investment. I'm investing in me. I'm investing in my book. I'm investing in my future. <laughs> and so that's where one of those hangups is when it comes to paying for an editor, you know, going and finding the cheapest editor to do your book is not always the wisest idea. Yes, there are some good editors that don't charge a lot. And there are some bad editors who charge a, a very substantial fee, but it's finding the right ones to work with, the people that you resonate. And then when it came to marketing your book, I, my assumption is, because like with anybody I know that does hybrid publishing, is you have to do the marketing. It's not all on them. So do you have any tips in regards to marketing your books? Yeah. It, well, the advice that I got from my publisher, uh, it was, it's a marathon, not a sprint. Right. So it's been, my book came out in October, 2020. And 
um, I've I've used those those words that she you know it's it's a marathon it's not a sprint to encourage myself mm-hmm. because m- you know my book hasn't really you know sold a whole lot um, but also it go this goes back to wanting to use professionals because and and looking at it as an investment because it really is an investment in my in my business which is. I'm a, I'm a mind body therapist or a mind body coach, life coach. So I can really use my book to um, increase my business and get my message out to more people Mm -hmm. to uh, work with me, to um, come to, you know, my website or take an online course or work with me one-on-one or just really use, um, you know, my book that way. And it, that also is a way to, you know, that I use to market it. And then podcasts is I I really enjoy doing podcasts um, in, in the trauma field, in the writing field, in the health and wellness field, there's a lot of podcasts um, that uh, I've actually enjoyed being on and being interviewed. Um, And just keep, um, creating more and more content also around the book. So I created recently a 13, um, video series, lecture series of 13 videos on my book, each chapter. So it, to, to accompany it. And that, that was a lot of fun. I just went on (laughs) <laughs> um, meet up and and made a meetup group and then I just went chapter by chapter every week and and talked about in depth more in depth about each chapter kind of like a workbook okay interesting I love that idea and and just keep uh, using it that way is my marketing strategy and um, trusting that it's going to help people that um, people will enjoy reading it. And of course, recommend it, you know, therapists who read it can recommend it to their clients, friends, family members, you know, just keep recommending it to keep um, writing more about it, like in, in my blog. I, I like that you use the word trusting because of the fact that you're not forcing, you're not out there forcing the sale or or putting that pressure on yourself. You're trusting, meaning you're allowing it to expand naturally um, without that that rigid resistance. You know, it's got to be done this way (laughs) or it's got to be done that way or, you know, or it's not going to work or you know, taking that, that pressure off. I, I like that you use that your, your yeah. process. And I do have to say, I love your book cover. I absolutely love it. So what inspired you to use that image or, you know, was that the, the plan from the beginning or. I just Actually, I had no uh, idea myself personally. I, um, worked with a book designer. So she's one of the professionals that uh, was recommended to me. And we talked about my book. She, um, I think, I think she, she read a few chapters of my book. We talked about it and, um, and then she provided me several, I think maybe nine or 10 possibilities we okay. narrowed it down. We kept, she kept working with me. And then this is the design that I decided upon, but it, it's her design. It is. I love the cover. Just, there's you. so many, there's so many messages within it. The butterflies, the jar, you know, mm-hmm. <laughs> it's, and it's such a piece. The colors are very peaceful and very soothing and very grounding. It's kind of like, yeah brings you down to a to a nice comfortable level so yeah oh thank you thank you yeah I love it too I I really do yeah Claire did a great job 
Yeah, she did. She mm -hmm. did. Was there anything that you wanted to talk about before we wrap up our time together? Is there something I missed in asking or that you'd like to share? Um, I, you know, I think um, writing for me, like I said, has just been about um, the journey of healing and be becoming more comfortable with who I am and and developing that security within myself that I'm good enough just the way I am, which is what unconditional love is really is just accepting ourselves just the way we are, that we're good enough. And that, you know, it's for me, it's, it's, it's been a great um, tool. I, I can't really think of any other word to, to describe it. Um, but a, a way that I've been able to express that journey to others. And that's really the message, you know, that I'd like to, I guess, end with was, is find what works for you to be able to get in touch with who you are and um, express your true self in this world. Yes. Because we all benefit. I think, and um, yeah, there's no reason to hide who we are. Yeah, of a reason, other than if you want to fit in with, you know, somebody's definition of what's acceptable, and who's to say that definition is the right one? <laughs> you know? Yeah, and we have conversations like this. That's beautiful. You know, more and more. People join in on the conversation. Oh, and I, and I would like to invite everybody to uh, my meetup group, uh, How to Heal Transgenerational Trauma, which is just a, a community of people that have formed from that video series that I created and join in on the conversation. We just meet once a week on Zoom uh, through meetup okay. and talk about how to continue healing transgenerational trauma. I want to thank you for, for joining me here in the Pen to Paper Press virtual studio. And thank you for your time, your wisdom. Lots of great information here. Again, thank you. <laughs> and thank you too for doing this podcast and, you know, giving me this opportunity to, you know, be on your platform. I really appreciate it. Thank you for having me. And I've enjoyed getting to know you too. Well, thank you. Let's keep in touch. Before we end our time together, I'd like to say thank you for joining us. To access Dorothy Houston's website and the book she has written, go to the show notes for this episode at pentapaperpress.com backslash podcast. Take a moment and leave us a comment on the show notes page. We love to read the takeaways you gained in this episode. To receive further episodes in your inbox, subscribe to the Pen to Paper Press newsletter, and you can also subscribe to your favorite podcast app. Take care, and until next time, keep your pen to paper and write, and know that your words have power. Your story matters. Bye for now.